Tom here from Large Systems. Ever wonder what Docker containers I'm actually running in my lab? Well, today I'm going to show you my setup and why I keep most everything inside of a single Debian VM with bind mounts. Spoiler, I do it because it's easier to manage, maintain, and back up. Now, one of those containers I rely on is from today's sponsor, NetBird. It is an open source, secure overlay networking platform that makes it easy to connect devices and networks. No clunky VPN configs, just simple secure access that helps you build and manage a zero trust architecture. NetBird works great in labs and in production, and even supports multi-tenancy for IT pros tasked with managing multiple clients. You can self-host the entire system or let them handle the hosting for you. Check out the link below to get started. The first thing I want to address is things people have probably already left a comment down below is why not Kubernetes right now? Because, you know, someone said you should do that. And I think Kubernetes is great. It's how we solve large scalable problems. Google uses it and many of the other hyperscalers. But I like simplicity, which is why I'm going with this approach. There's nothing wrong with Kubernetes. It's just a more complicated methodology that has its merits. And for home lab users that are pursuing a career that would be using Kubernetes or they just want to go on the personal learning adventure, by all means, go do it. I can't tell you why not to use Kubernetes with the one exception of complexity. I look for simplicity. I like this running in a single VM. And I just want to put this statement in here just to address all those people who go, but Tom, you have all this hardware. Why not stretch it out as a Kubernetes cluster across all of it? And wouldn't that make more sense? And this runs a lot of other different things. But today we're focusing on the Docker VM and what I run in it and how I run it. Now, I'm not going to walk through every detail of the install, but if you'd like me to do a video on that in the future, leave a comment down below. But the install Docker engine on Debian instructions here right in the Docker docs is what I followed. I am running because it came out recently and I just rebuilt it just to make sure there was no issues of following this guide. Debian 13 called Trixie and the setup app repository, all these functions worked perfectly fine. The one thing I will mention and this is a minor detail. And if you want to know what my video notes look like, this is what they look like here. The DNS problem. I ran into kind of a weird issue with Trixie where Docker containers that work fine in 12 weren't working in 13 because of DNS. I changed nothing. They're the same composed files. But I want to mention in case you're banging your head on this, if you have a instance that's not properly working with DNS, but has routing, uh, adding this line fixed it. You just create a etsy slash docker slash daemon dot json, edit it if it already exists. For me, it didn't exist. And I had to add it and put in DNS. Now it by default, I put in Google DNS here, but probably you want to use your local DNS. And that's what I changed it to. But I put this in rather than mine. So someone doesn't just go, hey, I can put in that DNS, but Tom's DNS locally didn't work on my setup. So start with public DNS to make sure things are working. Switch to local DNS if you need that local name server, which might be a better idea, but it depends on the context in which you're running things. Now, my notes tool is LogSeq and it's not public. So I put a public forum post, which you'll find linked down below to that DNS entry. So you can just copy and paste it, not try to read something off the screen. And more importantly, this is a list of the Docker services. I'm going to show them in a moment, but I'll point out that for any one of these, I have linked to the Docker install guide website, whichever it may be. And for Owens, I've already done videos on, I have linked those videos for my Fresh RSS. I have the link to Fresh RSS and of course the video, Apache Guacamole and a lot of other apps in here. So if you just are looking for the list, you can stop watching here, click on this list and just go through them. Now let's talk about how I structure Docker. Everything is loaded in slash SRV slash Docker. And if we do an LS, you can see all of my different Docker containers. And we'll go here to Nginx Proxy Manager and you can see data and let's encrypt. So if we go into the Docker compose file, you can see it's mounted to slash SRV slash Docker slash Nginx Proxy Manager data and then maps to data. This allows me to get right into any of the files as opposed to using the Docker file system. I know there's going to be a lot of opinions on this. I do this for simplicity because if I ever wanted to move Nginx Proxy Manager somewhere else, I simply grab just that folder for any one of these. And inside each of these is any of the configuration data, the compose file, everything it needs to live somewhere else. So when I move this from Debian 12, because I wanted to build a new Debian 13, I simply just copied and pasted these in. And because I gave the Debian 13 the same IP, everything just worked when I brought each of these Docker containers up. Now, this is my Homer dashboard. And there's a few things extra in here that are running on my TrueNAS, such as MeTube, which is pretty cool plugin for TrueNAS if you need to 
download things. I'll leave it at that. Uh, Jellyfin, I usually run on TrueNAS and I left it in the list because I'm actually running it here on my Docker system. This does create a little bit of complexity, but it was part of an upcoming video that I will be doing on Jellyfin. I wanted to try it not just on TrueNAS, but also in my Docker host. And of course, if you run it in your Docker host, you need to mount your TrueNAS and I choose NFS to do that. I have found a little bit of uh, bugs with it that I haven't 100% sorted out for the video because of the way the mounts work with system D and 13. So if you want to go down the path of running Jellyfin on there and having it mount NFS, yes, it works. And if you solve that problem, please post in my forums if you have the startup issue where you have to start it twice. I'll leave it at that because that's why that's a future video and not something I'm necessarily saying is the easiest solution right now. It does work perfectly fine on TrueNAS. But coming over here, Fresh RSS, I've done a video on it. It's my newsreader. I really love Fresh RSS because I don't like the news being driven by an algorithm that suggests whatever is the best clickbait versus I want the news sources I have to be concise and in some type of chronological order from valid news sources, not random ones. I have a list you'll find linked down below as well to lawrence.video slash cyber news, which is my news sources and my OPML file. If you're thinking about getting started with Fresh RSS, so you don't have to start from scratch of adding sources in there. Maybe you like some of the same news sources I have for tech news. 13 foot ladder. Well, we'll just say that this site is really handy for uh, giving what Google has as a view when it crawls the pages, as opposed to all the extra scripts and stuff that may be running that maybe annoy you quite a bit. I'll just leave it at that. Check it out. 13 foot's a pretty neat project. It's kind of an extension from the 12 foot.io for those of you familiar with that. Do some reading. As I said, there's a link right to the site and explains better what it does. Open Web UI is a front end for Olama. I've got a video on Olama, but I don't have a specific video on Open Web UI. But essentially, this is going to give you that interface. And who knows what is in here? Oh, yeah, all kinds of random things. Uh, for metrics and stuff I was looking up using self-hosted AI. This allows you to interact with and share different models, being able to choose which model gets loaded and ask the questions. I really like this. We've got a video for getting started with Olama and maybe I'll do a separate one in Open Web UI, but I think there's enough people that have already done them. So I don't know that I would add a ton of value to that video, but still Open Web UI is great. A couple of unique ones, IT tools. This is a little Swiss army knife of handy little, well, generators of things like SQL pretty format or UUID generator, ULID generator, encrypt, decrypt text, token generators, hash text from MD5, SHA-1, et cetera. Sometimes when you're doing IT work, you need some of these things. Uh, you can buy this person a coffee to support the project, but I like that it's self-hosted because I hate having a link to a site and maybe I'm solving a problem that involves the internet being down and one of these tools would be handy to have. So having it local means I always have access to it. Plus, I don't worry about things I'm putting into it because they're not going to some random website. They're going to the self-hosted one and it doesn't have any storage attached to it. So it doesn't save any of the data that goes in here. CyberChef. If you work in cybersecurity, you've probably heard of CyberChef. It does encoding and decoding to a lot of different formats. It's great for when you're sorting out data that may be encoded in an unusual way. You can just start throwing different recipes together to figure out how to decode that data. Or sometimes it's when you're sorting out things in logs that are, well, weird because of the way the tooling works. This is a great tool to help decipher all of that and pull data out and put it back together. Or if you have to encode data, it, it does it both ways. Next, we have NetAlert X. This is a pretty cool tool for discovery. You plug it into your network. I have a whole setup video on this. It's a great discovery tool, relatively easy to get set up, fully open source and free. Can do monitoring of, let you know what devices are connected, new devices discovered, and can do down a monitoring and alerting. And currently it has found 146 devices. It also is able to pull via API and different connectors, other data sources, and bring them all in together. Next, we have NetData. NetData is one of those tools that over the years has just gotten better. I really like it as a tool to be able to visualize what's going on, what might be causing an event, because you may know when the event happened, but you need to go back in time to when the event happened at a certain time of day at like 1255 or 1300 and go over 
in a nice, concise way to find all the different metrics that were related, like what caused this problem or what was the system doing? What caused the memory increase here? And was it an application? And you can filter through these. I use net data across a lot of systems. So I also have it loaded on this system running Docker. It can do metric correlations to try to group together the events. Uh, it has the ability to zoom in. I've got a video linked where I've done this with net data. I probably should do a new one because it's a couple of years old and it looks much better now than it did a few years ago. Uh, but net data is a great open source tool for being able to monitor in real time or even have some historical data when you're doing troubleshooting, especially related to performance. Apache Guacamole. I have an entire video on this. It is a really nice tool to let you use the web interface for things like SSH administration and maybe occasionally typing your password wrong. So back home, I've already got it connected to this one. I can do SSH administration all through a web UI. It will also do VNC. It'll also do RDP. So SSH, RDP, VNC, all in a web browser and being able to jump back and forth to other servers that you can line up in here, add and build out connections. Once again, open source and self-hostable, also very customizable. This actually serves as a basis sometimes for other tooling that might be more commercial. If you're wondering if it can be customized quite a bit, it does have the basic needs met in terms of interface, but there's a lot of enhancement that can go on top of it. And I do talk about that in my video and of course, further reading at the Apache Guacamole site. Open speed test. It's no more than a locally hosted speed test, so it doesn't have to go out to the internet. Well, unless I guess you installed this on an external server you host, but ideally you use this internally so you can do speed testing, whether it be hardline or probably more likely and something I've used it more often for is Wi-Fi testing. I don't want to go out to the WAN and to the ISP where the bottleneck might be. I don't know how fast the WAN is, maybe at different distances. Having a locally hosted means I've eliminated any external ISP level factors for speed testing or troubleshooting a Wi-Fi connection. Really handy little tool. The last two tools I'm going to cover are Dozzle and What Up Docker. Dozzle, it allows you to attach to any of the running containers and see all the logs. You can do this from the command line and attach containers and look at the output, but why not do it through a nice, simple web interface? Or you can look at all of them at once by clicking the link up here and it'll consolidate all of them and tell you where these logs came from. And if you have a lot of complicated things going on, it gives you a nice single pane of glass view for all the logs. But clicking on any individual one lets you put these here. We can even do split screen between two different sections because this, for example, is a stack that has three different components in it. And maybe we need these things side by side because we're trying to figure out what's talking to what or what's not talking to what at the same time. Dozzle is just really a handy way to do this without having to resort to the command line, which I mean, I like being at the command line, but sometimes a nice little UI and being able to click it does help quite a bit. And last but not least is what up Docker really simple tool that has a lot of options that I haven't really enabled. I mostly just use it for what you're seeing here. I want to know if there's an update available and then I'll manually update. I know somebody's probably saying, but Tom, why don't you have Watchtower on here where it's auto updating all of your Docker images? And maybe I'll do that in the future. For now, I just go to what up Docker. It lets me know that things are needing updates and you can build triggers to notify you or even build out a trigger to actually update these. It has a lot of options, a lot of extensibility. I have done none of that extensibility. There are guides you can find on it. If I do build this out, I of course do a video on it, but a lot of people might be interested in it because it's just simplicity. I like the how simple it is that it just looks, watches, lets me know what needs to be updated. And then I can just do a compose pull from the command line and uh, pull the latest version as needed. And always make sure you have a backup before you do that. Now, the last thing I want to mention is exactly where this lives, as in what hypervisor am I using? I run this Docker container in XCPNG. It is my place that I like hosting things for virtualization. You may like other tools. Proxmox is great. You can do the same thing with Proxmox. I just really like the integrated backups, the automated validation testing that XCPNG has. So it doesn't just back it up because who cares about a backup that works and says successful? We want a restore that works and this will do that full validation. So I'm comfortable having it here, but use whatever hypervisor makes you happy. The couple exceptions, as I noted, there's a few things that actually run directly on TrueNAS. And uh, I still think Jellyfin and other media streaming tools are probably best suited to run on TrueNAS, but that's, I'm still doing some experimenting. And as I said, leave some comments and maybe I'll do a Jellyfin video of running it in its own separate container versus running it on a TrueNAS.
If you got thoughts, questions, or a different take on today's topic, drop them in the comments down below. Want to support the channel in other ways? You can do that through Patreon or by grabbing items from our swag store. We've got some fun tech-themed shirts, stickers, and other nerdy gear that won't boost your bandwidth, but will definitely boost your style. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss future videos. If you're looking to connect with me or learn more about the services we offer, just head over to lawrencesystems.com. You'll find all my links to the socials and the best ways to get in touch. If you found this video helpful, chances are you'll find the next one helpful too. So keep learning and keep clicking wherever those videos are showing up around me. Thanks.